welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Joy J. Moore. And I'm Christopher Fan Kaufman. So this is the podcast for February 12th, 2023. And we have, um, we're still in uh, the Epiphany section of Matthew as we're in the Epiphany season, as the first half of Matthew up to chapter 16 has the uh, the revelation of the Son of God in human history. And Jesus taught in parables, and chapter 13 is the parable chapter. We're, we're dropping down um, in verse 24 with the parable of the wheat and the weeds, and then the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the yeast. Uh, Jesus' confusing statement, at least in Mark, less confusing in Matthew, about the use of parables. And then on to the explanation. And then if you want to add verses, there's more parables. So that's where we are. Um, One place I want to start with the parable of the weeds and the wheat is to say um, that parables, you know, we like to say that metaphors are both true. You know, when you use a metaphor, it's both true and untrue. God is a rock. That's both true. And it's not true, you know, in the sense that God is not ontologically a rock. So the truth here, I think, is that this is how life is, that we are, um, that uh, any violent, any violent solution to the problem of human sin wipes out humanity, um, as the flood story also tells. And so the only solution to human sin has to come from beyond time that we are what we are as we lutherans say simultaneously saint and sinner there's my opening pitch i'm going to be dangerous in this podcast because unfortunately i wrote my dissertation on this uh, chapter so i need to be restrained take by everything my back that i already here <laughs> But one of the things that I, within that, I just want to give a little bit of um, advice on parables, which is from my, one of my heroes, Birger Gerhardson, who was a great interpreter of the parables. And he gave the advice, be very careful if you cut a parable out of its frame, which is that the parables as we have them, Matthew has placed them somewhere for a reason. And Jesus certainly spoke them in certain times and places, not as abstract wisdom, but to meet certain uh, situations in life. And so as we come to these parables, I just encourage us to look at what is Jesus, who is Jesus talking to? What is the situation that he's talking in? And to keep that in mind as we read parables. So that's one of the things that I I think is very important. with any parable, but here in Matthew as well. So apply that to chapter 13 for us. Well, one of the important things is that we get in the parables, uh, not a shift, but we saw up on uh, the mountain with the Sermon on the Mount in our last three podcasts, the way in which Jesus was teaching on the law and teaching on this stance of dependence. And I think that what that means partially when we get to Matthew 13 is we have to ask, okay, how does that, this discourse on parables fit together with what we learned in the Sermon on the Mount? Uh, Not, again, not as something distinct, but as part of what Matthew is trying to tell us about Jesus. And so repeating what Joy has said, I'm gonna repeat this throughout these podcasts. If we read these parables as telling us and teaching us about our dependence on God and our, that stance that we take to each other, I think that's a very powerful interpretive key to them, especially if you take something like the weeds and the wheat, which can unfortunately be used to think of uh, the wheat as the superior and the weeds as the inferior and to uh, be proud of being wheat. But instead of saying uh, that this is about the dependence of God, dependence on God. um... I appreciate that. And um, I'm trying to think if it's the commentary here uh, that um, 
challenges us to um, uh, oh, I can't find it because I thought I yes, uh, it is this one um, uh, that in the commentary ends by uh, basically not trying to figure out who's wheat or or, or weeds or or who's superior or that, but um, puts it in the idea of are you going to be wheat? Uh, and I like that. The, if the wheat are those who hear, rather than pointing the finger at others, at pointing the finger at ourselves and asking, will I choose to listen? Will I choose to obey? Um, two things come to mind when I, when I read uh, chapter 13. Uh, one is the question. Um, largely, we know Jesus' disciples to be fishermen. With the instruction, I will make you fishers of people. Um, yeah, we have a tax collector in there, and you know, but but we largely think of them as fishermen. So, being from sh the city of Chicago, I get that they didn't understand this planting metaphor. <laughs> but what it also makes me think of is throughout, as you mentioned, uh, as we began this, uh, Christopher, the plethora of metaphors that Jesus is using, this in one way is Matthew's way of speaking Jesus's words to the world. So um, if I go outside of Matthew for just a bit, uh, when I was studying Luke, um, it was brought to my attention that Luke will talk about a named person of importance and then talk about an unnamed person. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the person that's on the inside and then the same encounter of Jesus happening with a person who's on the outside. And so Luke has this kind of juxtaposition of people encountering Jesus who are from one group as well as the other. Um, when I began to, to teach preaching with uh, Caroline Lewis, who studied John, she pointed out that John does the exact same thing. Um, and I love to point out, uh, as she does, John chapter three, Nicodemus, John chapter four, the woman at the well, named leader, unnamed um, person in the community. And in each of those, we are beginning to take note of the way that the gospel is speaking to all the world. I think the metaphors that are used in the parables is a way to recognize that the wisdom of God is being communicated to absolutely everyone, to women who bake, to men who sow in the field, eventually to fishermen, <laughs> to tax collectors. I just, I just would want to put that out there. I appreciate that. I, um, I, uh, two comments. First of all, like when I think about the wheat and the weeds, I don't think about like how can I be wheat and not weeds, but I think about how how are there weeds and wheat both growing in me? How am I both? How am I the field rather than the plants? Right. The kingdom of God can be compared to someone who sowed good seeds in the field. I'm the field, not I'm not the wheat or the weeds. And because of my own experience, then I cannot. I cannot think about this without thinking about the cancer I had. I had cancer in both of my femurs in my legs. And I get this all the time. I got this at a funeral I was at last week. Little kids had never met me. What happened to you? Well, I had to explain to them the only way to get rid of the wheat, excuse me, the weeds that was in the bones was to cut the bones away. Well, finally, there's a point in our humanity when that cannot happen. And so we are left to grow with. With, I still got lots of weeds, uh, but I am God's good field. Um, so that's just one thing. The other thing is, uh, it's always a risk. I, I was reading a book about narrative. Well, I read lots of books about narrative theory and stories. When we started the narrative lectionary, by the way, uh, in order to explain why I thought why we thought knowing the biblical narrative is essential to Christian spirituality. And one of the things was 
don't explain your stories. It said the more work your story requires of the interpreter, the more effective it is. That's why Jesus, for the most part, does not explain his parables, except he explains the weed and the weed. Although maybe that was the early Christian community explaining it. Um, but I want to go from here to that to that mustard seed parable, uh, where Jesus says, you know, here's the must uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone has sowed in the field. It's the smallest of all seeds. That's not literal. It just means it's one of the smallest because we know it's not the smallest, but it grows into these great big plants. Now I've seen Christopher. I want to ask you. I've seen photos of mustard trees or big plants that are just like huge, right? Um, and is that the same mustard seed, same mustard plant? So without getting too technical, because this is not a botany lecture, <laughs> there are two candidates for the mustard. One is a tree that probably gets about 20 feet tall, Salvador Persica. And, but the other is just a bush. And uh, I think that this there's this great, um, it's almost a joke, uh, this great, what does it grow into? The greatest of all shrubs. So if you go to California, which is a similar environment to um, Galilee, there is mustard growing everywhere as an invasive weed. And you see, it makes this kind of big shrub. It's just about as tall as I am, you know, about six feet tall and maybe three feet wide. And yeah, it's kind of a thicket. It's a shrub. It's not a redwood, shall we say. And I think that's part of the, the great joy of this parable is that it's this funny little uh, change in expectation. It is not a towering tree that the kingdom of heaven grows into, but this, this shrub that still provides shelter and food and a place for God's creation. I think there is an, an illusion here, like you just said. So it says, so it becomes, the, you know, this big plant or whatever, so that the birds of the air come and make their nest in them. And I'm reminded of the psalm that says, look, God, um, how wonderful are your dwelling places how, and how amazing is your temple where even the birds build their nests next to your altar. I, um, I, yeah, I appreciate, Ralph, your um, talking about your, the, the weed and the wheat in you. And when I look at this particular uh, portion of the parable, I think of the weed and the wheat in the world. Um, last week, uh, well, um, with this week, no, it was last week, not to judge. Um, when we recognize that the field that we are to go out and proclaim this promise of God's shalom, um, rather than trying to decide who's in and who's out, to take the attitude that you just described and say, you know, what Jesus says in another place, the two are going to continue to grow together. Let God worry about doing the sorting. Our job is to be a glimpse of the shalom so that everyone can find a dwelling place. <laughs>